Hello, everybody. Today's panel in this room is Domesticity in Fantastic Settings. I will turn the time over to the panelists now. Hi, I'm your moderator, Dre Griffin. And today, like you said, we're discussing domesticity and fantastic settings. Um, I would like to give our panelists a minute to introduce themselves, starting with my left, I think, is Clark. Hi, I'm CR Rowenson. Uh, call me Clark when we're talking in person. I am a freelance developmental editor and writing coach, and I write exclusively nonfiction on crafting and repairing magic systems for fictional games, TV shows, and novels. And the book that I released last year is Restrictions May Apply. It's a workbook specifically designed to help you build limitations for your magic system. Hey. James. Yes, I'm uh, James Jenkins. I'm author of many subgenres in fantasy, including urban, sword and sorcery, epic. Uh, I'm most well known for my Jack Blood Fist urban fantasy series about an orc in a suit. Hey, Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Haas. I'm an uh, intercultural historian. I anthropologist, anthropologist and historian. I study what happens when cultures interact. And I tend to talk about how video games have opened up a new society within that. Sarah. All right. So my name is Sarah Seeley. Um, I'm a Paleolithic archaeologist. Um, so I like to study um, human origins related archaeology. So particularly looking at early stone tool cultures like the Oldowan and Acheulean and um, human evolution. Um, related uh, things. And um, I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror, uh, mostly short stories and novelettes. Fun, fun. Emma. Hi, I'm uh, Emma Preston or Emma Hankins. I honestly go by either name and I don't really care. Um, I'm uh, uh, mostly here to talk about textiles and sewing, um, anything related to that. Um, I, I uh, am a pretty avid dressmaker and seamstress and all that kind of stuff. And um, I've uh, put a lot of, basically a lot of my free time into studying about the history of textiles and clothing and how that interweaves with how societies work and everything. So I'm here to talk about that. Cool. All right. So let's see our first question. So what exactly is domesticity? Should we define define that for our audience? I was going to say, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, me! <laughs> yes! <I'm sorry>. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm an artist and writer. Um, you can find me at dragriffin.com. I do comics. I'm working on novels yet to be published. Um, ADHD Slytherin, so I try to do a lot of things and have yet to actually accomplish much. Um, <laughs> but I love to learn, and I have read a lot about writing and everything else so yeah i kind of know what i'm talking about <laughs> i sympathize <laughs> with you on that one <laughs> <laughs> all right so first question yeah. let's define is... domesticity well i mean domestic generally we think about the home things that center around home and family life Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know. Is there, is, there more to it? is there more to it than that, really? I don't know. Yeah, panel over. That's it. <laughs> yep. That's one of those things that's, like, really hard to define without just, you know, pulling out the book definition. Exactly. Like, you could read an entire book that, oh, okay, here's this domestic, and this is domestic, and this is, you know, and, that, and that's really kind of, yeah, it's, it's yeah. the home and family life would be pretty the, much the Pretty yeah. much everything that relates to living on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. 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 And cooperating like as well, I would yeah. I would say. And yeah. um, it also makes me think of just the term docile and um, just coming from the that um, Paleolithic perspective, looking at like domestication. So you could look at like yeah. Um, yeah, you know, plants true. and animals we've domesticated, so they're more tame. So, you know, we have mm -hmm. pets that we enjoy um, just for fun or for protection or whatever. And, uh, or and, animals uh, that serve a function. Yeah, yeah. And then plants that are much tastier and more edible and less poisonous and, and you know, easier to cultivate and, and uh, or take care of. Or getting more of whatever resource you need from them, even if it's not a food resource. Yeah. 
30 wow. seconds in and I'm going to go off on a tangent because that's really, <laughs> that's really <Go> interesting <laughs> how um, I didn't think about this, but even just the term domesticity kind of implies a certain level of society mm -hmm. after what yeah. you were saying, Sarah, is you're not going to be looking at many of your uh, tribal societies or unlikely to be looking at specific nomadic societies. If you're really getting into the domesticity of a people, you're probably looking at more agrarian or post-agrarian. Uh, I thought there, that was interesting. Well, you could. You could I mean, relative to early hominins. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah I like, mean, hunter-gatherer hunter societies just have different ways of organizing hmm. their home. Like if yeah. they're nomadic, home kind of goes with them. Yeah, yeah, rather yeah. than home what being a set up? location that it's you home. Yeah, have to yeah. carry home with you. Um, I mean, like, like uh, if you think of like the Plains Indians, uh, I'm, I currently live in Montana, so I've observed a lot of that, and I'm experiencing the winter for the first time. And I was just asking my husband, I'm like, how on earth did they live in this winter when it's, it's so <laughs> incredibly cold? It's been like negative 20, negative 30 the past few days. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and, but, but they, they were nomadic and they lived in tents. And mm -hmm. basically, yeah, like you, you have to build, because I'm thinking of tents, like, you know, the, 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 the tents that the tribes of the Middle East would carry around with them are very different because they're not worried yes. about insulation factor quite yeah. as yeah. much. Whereas the tents in this part of the country are, are different. And so, yeah, even just like the nature of the home of what physically is home is going to change depending on what culture you're in and what their needs are. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. basically... Uh, what's basically happening is you have certain emphases within your uh, society and that creates uh -huh. what you consider normal. Yeah. And if somebody yeah. from outside of that society came in and didn't know about those emphases, they would be considered not normal because they didn't know about them. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. For a, a modern example here in Utah, we have a lot of people who just really emphasize the 1980s down to the haircut and it weirds me out every time <laughs> I visit. Is that a particular and, Utah thing? I didn't realize. Yeah. Like, <laughs> nobody with those haircuts shows up outside of Utah. I live, in, I live in the Northwest. I do not see a lot of Karen haircuts That's funny. in Seattle or Portland. <laughs> but there you, you go, go to Marie. Utah, and it's everywhere. Uh, so <laughs> those are things that you just, without even thinking about it, is just part of your society. Yeah. And so that's kind of what you uh, assume everything is about. You know, how is your house built? What is your day-to-day -day life has those emphases within it? Mm -hmm. And That's going terrible. back to Paleolithic example, just really quickly too, um, just uh, the idea of you have, um, uh, you know, with our species, perhaps with Neanderthals and, and some other uh, um, early hominins as well, um, you have, um, yeah, especially with our species it's it's much easier to to tell that we were doing this early on but um we're, we have this home base so we have this place where we're bringing food um from someplace else from hunting somewhere and we're bringing food distinctly somewhere to share it um to uh, reinforce social bonds to um you know uh, enact different kinds of divisions of labor. It might be between older and younger individuals. It might be mm -hmm. um, uh, sex divisions of labor. So men and women uh, might have had different roles. So we don't, uh, looking at early hunter-gatherer societies, it's not mm -hmm. always clear um, how that actually worked. Um, we have a, a little bit of um, uh, Western bias that creeps into some of that sometimes where we think women were just doing the the um, gathering and men were all doing the hunting, but that might not necessarily have been the case. Um, so yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, so we kind of start off with, there's uh, there's this gathering place where we're, we're coming together, we're kind of combining um, our efforts in a coordinated way to, yeah, to just kind of survive and, and bond with each other and learn from each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And yeah. Yeah. Even the nomadic <laughs> <laughs> Even the nomadic cultures in our modern time have like a time of year where they create a city. Uh, mm -hmm. In the Comanche Empire, which mm -hmm. happened between the 16th and 19th century, they would actually once a year all get together in Texas and create a giant city with millions of people, decide on which tribe or which clan and which part of the tribe was going where, and then they would disappear. Mm -hmm. And it looks a lot like our modern conventions, if you ever see it. Mm -hmm. Like just nothing and then whole city and then it's just gone mm -hmm. and it's weird wow. to think about 
Hmm. But that mm -hmm. would be their version of the home. Yeah, you just hey. that's the you carry your home with you version. Hmm. But one one of the things that I want to bring up, um, you know, with my particular interest in textiles, um, think about how like nowadays we're so used to things being made by machine, you know, machine yarn and thread and fabric and all that kind of stuff. It's all made by machine. The thing is, all of that before they invented the machines to make it was extremely labor intensive. Like I've tried spinning yarn and I never got very good at it. It's really, really difficult. Um, Cause like, it's just, it just, there's a lot of skill involved in making it actually good quality functional yarn. And um, yeah. if you are in a society that does not have that industry and that technology to create, you know, spinning, and and weaving mills and that kind of stuff um then your people are going to be spending a lot of time at home making those things which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why we often think of that as traditionally as women's work which you know shouldn't really be be degraded or anything just just like just because it's work that's done in the home doesn't mean it's not work and doesn't mean that it's not helping to support your family both materially and financially but that would be a, a typical thing is that is that um, whoever is at the home and some men included sometimes, but um, but women were a little bit more likely to be spending a greater portion of their time physically in the home. And that's kind of what they do. If you don't have something else to be doing, then you're going to find something to do. And one of those things is going to be you're going to be knitting the socks because socks are super labor intensive or you're going to be weaving the fabric so you can make shirts later or you're going to be spinning mm -hmm. the thread so you can weave that fabric or so you can stitch the shirts together. And, and all of those are so labor intensive that it, it's baffling how nowadays if I need a pair of socks I just go to the store and I can buy you know 10 socks for five bucks or whatever you know like it, it's ridiculous that you can do that mm -hmm. true yeah. I was just in the uh matriarch matriarchal society and yeah I mentioned this was in matriarchal society a lot of the time it's just the emphasis has changed from the outside world you know uh -huh. the, the hunter to the gatherer, the people making uh -huh. the textiles, which is called it. And, you know, in the Navajo society, the woman's loom is considered almost the center of the home, and all the women yes. gather around it, and they talk about it, and mm -hmm. they, they kind of build this loom, and that's where a lot of the decisions are made. And then they'll have kind of the, the society, or they'll have the decision-making council, and the decision-making council is actually looking at the people who had just made the rug. And yeah. looking at them for an answer because the people on the outside of the reservation are expecting this council to make decisions, not knowing that the council was made was already at the loom because they don't know about the loom. Yeah. Yeah. James, did you have anything to add? Uh from that point, no. I when we get to the okay. writing section, I'm gonna have a lot to talk about. But oh, okay. as far okay. as <laughs> the smart They're people, fucking... let's let them talk about everything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So basically, we've taken that domesticity and said, well, it's something simple. And then, wait a minute, it's super complex. Yeah. <laughs> <But> basically, <laughs> it boils down to what is, for intents and purposes of this, what is the home, which is the basis of the society. I think mm -hmm. is kind of what we're getting at. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, how do you establish is, that? Yes? There is something interesting about this. I want you to think about uh, two blocks from your house. I, just think about your house, where you live, walk five minutes away from your house, and then realize that the people five minutes away from you have a completely different life from you. They have no connection to you. They have no, uh, they're never going to meet you. They're never going to uh, have a life with you. And yet they're only five minutes away. Mm -hmm. So that is another part of the domestic life we have to think about. For me right now, I live in Toronto, which is Canada and very, very, very diverse. Like I am living in a little suburban-ish area. It's just so weird because mm -hmm. it's like suburbs and then apartment sky rises and then a few more part and then sky rises and there's like a dentist's office like every block and it's like what <laughs> <laughs> and, but i live um 
Like and people have teeth. <laughs> yeah, people have teeth. Like so many people Everyone have teeth. Dentist. <laughs> There's a doctor on every block. On every block. And it's like, how do they all support themselves? Is it rich oh, for building? I want to follow up yeah. on something Keith mentioned <laughs> about how uh, if you walk five minutes away, at least currently, they can have a completely different sense of domesticity mm-hmm. and home than you do. Yeah. I do think that really varies depending on where you're looking at in your kind of ages of history and Mm -hmm. what type of culture you're wanting to build up. Because going back to some of the more primitive stuff, when you have the smaller units, well, not necessarily primitive, but Paleolithic, that kind of thing, the sense of Mm -hmm. home is going to be more uniform across your units because they all have to be much more closely connected than we currently are now. Because Mm -hmm. since we have easy connections across states and countries and around the world, it lessens the need for me to have a deep understanding and connection and responsibility for the person next door. So that is something to think about as to how rapidly that can shift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was go five minutes outside of the village. You're eating yeah. my wolves. Yeah. I was my I wondered. But <laughs> with the five minute thing, like for me in Toronto, I live in a house and my neighbors on each side of me they are from completely different cultures they are brown skinned they are from definitely like the middle east mm-hmm. and probably even different parts of the middle east and mm-hmm. it's just amazing how yeah. even just like me i'm on the north american continent so different than utah or montana yeah, yeah. Uh, One Um, point that I want to make since we're talking about the word culture is um, remember that some, a person, each individual person can occupy several cultures. They can, they can live within several cultures and cultures intersect. Cultures can exist inside of larger cultures. I mean, in some respects, as we all speak English, we are all part of an English speaking culture, but obviously Mm -hmm. not all of us are from the United States or live in the United States. So there's a cultural divide there. We live in different parts of the country. There's cultural divides there. And then even even if you keep going and and going and zooming in closer, you can even go as far as each individual family has their own culture, which I'm fairly recently married. So I'm kind of discovering that, you know, as he has Mm -hmm. his family culture, I have my family culture and it's learning how to take those two family cultures and then create a third family culture from those two sources and just like everybody yeah just just, everybody has their own way of doing things that's right and my neighbors as an example they're middle eastern definitely but they're also christian yeah yeah but their christianity is different from christianity that you know it's uh, very coptic yeah maybe yeah yeah uh I was just thinking about my own family. My mother comes from very French, very Hobbit-like people, where <laughs> talking is against the rules. I actually had to talk, teach myself how to talk to people because my mother wouldn't do it. Mm. Whereas my dad comes from a very loud Argentine family where everybody is talking as loudly as they can. <laughs> family reunions, yeah. we get into a small room and yell at each other. <laughs> and it sounds like a jet engine. That's my family. And yet, yeah. <laughs> and then these two families met my parents got married and now we have to figure out how to maneuver around these two cultures. Mm. So I come off as really quiet. Uh, there's a German term called the, the castle walls. So if you're outside of my castle walls, I will be very Hobbit like with you. I'll be extremely quiet, but you come inside of my castle walls. Mm. I will be very loud and joking and friendly with you. And it freaked out all my friends at uh, school because at school I'd be like, Oh yeah. And then they'd come to my house and Very be like, quiet. hey, did you yeah, hear this yeah, one? Yeah, people behave differently <laughs> in different setting. For sure, yeah. for sure. So, so setting changes your behavior, absolutely. And, and and familiarity with people and things like that. Like some cultures, you're more likely to act much more extroverted with people that you don't know as well, whereas other cultures, it's less of a thing. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends in Scandinavia. My family has some some connection to that part of the world. And uh, um, they always laugh about how, like, uh, you know, in, in Scandinavia, you stand 
like 10 feet apart from each other if you're waiting in line for something. Whereas here you maybe yes. stand a couple, only two feet apart or that kind of thing. But I also spent a portion of my childhood in China where um, if you are not actively fighting for your place in line, then There's somebody no sees line. a gap this big, then they'll cut right in, <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's Very just true. a mass of bodies pushing towards whatever is the thing. So like cultures totally influence that, like how people just relate to one another, relate to people they know, relate to people they don't know. Uh, we were talking about cities and that kind of thing and how in a city, you know, you five minutes away, you don't know the person at all. If you live in a very rural area, five minutes away, you might not have even met anybody yet, <laughs> uh -huh. for one thing. Or it's or five minutes away is you're literally your next door neighbor and you know them really well because you rely on each other. So yeah. so contexts change. Mm -hmm. so I, yeah. I definitely want to make sure we get to talk about how to build some of this yes. up. Yes, yeah. that is... James, I know what you had some stuff you wanted to talk about with that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What Let's I do, segue. I now that we have discussed how awesome <laughs> and cool and different everything is. Today, <laughs> well, let's take some time to talk about how do we establish domesticity yes. in a fantastic setting. If I could start there. Um, yes. Not anything no. specific, but I think anyone that writes or is familiar with stories understands that as far as, like, especially in like a fantastical setting, fantastical story, domesticity is the starting point. Like a character always starts in the familiar and then moves away from that. Um, so as far as storytelling goes, domesticity is, it's either one of two things. It's the thing that the character wants to return to and protect or to get away from. And so that should always be your starting point. Like domesticity is for your character where the story should start. It's what's familiar for them. So it should be familiar for the reader, even if it's something fantastical, you know, the reader should know and understand the rules of the society. So I'd say that should be the starting point for any story. And in terms of developing that, there are two main methods that I generally pick up when I'm working on this with people. I mean, generally, I focus on how magic systems integrate into the world building and affect yeah. the society and that kind of stuff. But it's the same principle. Uh, the main two ways that I found work really well are, I've heard somebody call it acting like a four-year-old. You know, you just keep asking why of they do things yeah. this way. Why do they do it that way? Or starting with something backwards and just doing a logical chain. So something Emma had mentioned was just how time intensive making textiles was. Given that fact, how is that going to affect their weekly routine? How is it going to affect what they value in materials? How is it going to affect how they treat each other? How is it going to affect how they value their possessions? The other way that I really like to handle it is just, if I have no idea, is focusing on where the character would be comfortable. What makes them feel safe and what makes them feel at home? Um, very, very good. Something, something within a, a writing is they have what's called a straight man. The person who goes, oh, gee, I, <laughs> I have no idea about yeah. this. Tell me more. And I just realized last night um, that the Dursleys in Harry Potter were the straight men for the beginning of the book. Yeah. They're Definitely. trying to be normal. And that is helping us know that magic exists because we can see their normal life, them trying to be normal. And then the world Harry Potter is from and how they don't really know how to respond to it. And then Harry Potter becomes the, the straight man where he goes, I don't know about this. Tell me more. It's entirely speak so that we, the reader, can ask that question. Yeah. They can be the one that things get explained to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so you don't have that as you know Bob situation. It's good to have an outsider. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. I was going to say, as a horror author, um, domesticity um, and going into um, you, you know hitting at at the heart of um, you know here's what's supposed to be normal, or maybe it's presented at the beginning of the book as normal, and you start to see that there's a breakdown. Uh, and something in the domesticity can be quite compelling. Uh, dysfunctional relationships, um, you know, someone, uh, maybe somebody killed their spouse and they're they're pretending to be shocked. And as you go along, you realize that, oh, my gosh, you're you're the one who killed this person. <laughs> um, and there's other problems here and it's very complex. Um, so if you 
uh, you can very subtly build up some some tension if you attack. Uh, you know, you you go to that place where things are supposed to be normal, and you subvert it, um, and and go to the heart of um, just what's yeah, what's supposed to be normal, and what's supposed to be good, and what where where are things supposed to be grounded, where they're not grounded, and then the things right. further out in society that people are supposed to associate with um, also break down because there's a breakdown in that safe space. You know that space that's supposed to be safe and that's supposed to be a refuge where you can get away from the monsters that's where the monsters are instead um so that can be a, a fun way to um sort of play with with domesticity in in a horror context yeah for sure yeah because that actually can give you a lot of room to control and push your characters in different directions because feeding off what james said is people want to return to their sense of security, to their sense of home. So you start tweaking those little things so they don't feel right and they don't feel like home. You can use that to push characters in directions or just leave them completely lost because what was home isn't safe anymore and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I love horror, by the way, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, adds, it adds an extra <laughs> emotional punch, especially if you attack that safe space. Mm. I don't remember what movie it was. I remember years ago, it was a horror movie where a kid is hiding in bed and that's where the monster gets them. Mm -hmm. That was like, for me, it was like, no, mm -hmm. that's where you're safe. What are you doing? You broke so the I, I don't like what you're saying. You're safe. So accurate. Yeah. The goblins can't touch fabric. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> or it's like Psycho in the shower scene, you know? Yes. Like... Yeah, we're, yeah. we're but yeah, yeah, she's it, sorting it, out her yeah, life and everything's fine. And then it's like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A... And, and 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 you would. I mean, I mean, in the shower, you're 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 not even wearing clothes when you're in the shower. Like right. you, that's one of the ultimate places you want to feel yeah. safe, right? So yeah. it was a really Very really um, powerful <laughs> thing that they that they chose for that to be the moment when she dies. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just because because that's so terrifying. That's not yeah. a place where you want to be scared. That's not a place where you want to be in danger at all, ever. Yeah, so I the love one place Psycho. you feel safe enough to stand, <laughs> you shouldn't die there. <laughs> yeah. It's classic for a reason. You know, well, and and that... just with Psycho too, there's also a breakdown with the character who kills her. Um, uh, where on the surface it seems like you know there's there's some quirky yeah. things you yeah. know with with his you know the guy's relationship with his mother is a little quirky, and then you go along and you see that oh it's a little bit more dysfunctional yeah, than than that, and fun. then <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't give away the whole movie of Psycho, but <laughs> I think it's been out long enough. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's no, an I old mean, movie, but, uh... but James, it, it yeah. looks like you wanted to add something. What's that? Um, mm -hmm. it looks like you wanted to add something oh, no, a little bit there. Oh no, you're good. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, so so there's a kind of a secondary breakdown that leads to you know with with the the character who's the killer with his internal world where he's made some interesting choices related to the dysfunction and his you know on the surface to everyone else in town you know this is kind of a normal kind of quiet dorky guy and and um, you know kind of a he's sad situation created his oh. own inner world that's yeah. different from the outer world and and that feeds into all of his bad behaviors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's it's really it's kind of fascinating. I love Psycho. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is actually a version of the same idea within fantasy. Um, the main character starts in this village, and you know we get an an idea of their life, and then for some reason, usually because they're sent off on an adventure or their city their home is destroyed, they can't go home anymore. Mm -hmm. and that's a major part of the story is them trying to see what was outside of their home and then not knowing how to do that. Mm -hmm. It also lets us, yeah. The, yeah. the reader, feel the same way with them because we don't know that world either. And that actually is a great point. A, a lot of fantasy novels, the whole point of the story is this character leaving their home and then learning about the cultures of other homes. Like, there's his culture and then the culture he's introduced to. And to him and the reader, it's going to seem fantastical. But for those characters in that culture, that's just domesticity for them. That's just home life. Mm -hmm. So I think everything kind of comes back to what home life looks like. It's yeah. just it's just the contrast of one and the other. Or your character could be Frodo Baggins, who leaves home and and goes through all of these these experiences, several of which are extremely traumatic. And uh, then he returns back home and just find, finds that he can't ever really feel at home at home Never anymore. Same. 
mm-hmm. you know, yeah, his, his, his other three friends, you know, they, they come back home and they, they rescue it from, you know, the Sauron and all that, you know, they, they, if, if we're going by the book version, you know, Sauron has invaded the Shire and everything. So there's both the irony of that they've left home, but then home was attacked while they were gone. But then once they've, they've gotten there and they've established their place at home, and this is a part that's in both book and movie, you have the Frodo that he can't, he just doesn't feel at home there anymore. And the other three are able to readjust to that, but he can't. So which of those does your character fall into? That's a good point. I think it is time to start asking we have questions. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. All right. Oh, helpful LT Lee Fairy. Do we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have one. And this was uh, during the context of horror movies and the, the subverting the, the home feeling. Uh, what are some book slash movie examples of this done well and examples of this done poorly? Hmm. Okay, so I do have a really good one um, in terms of the subversion of the security of home. And that's Strangers by Michael Brent Collins. Um, Basically what happens is this family wakes up, they go to the front door, and the door's locked. They go to the back door, door's locked. They throw open the blinds, and there's steel shutters over the windows. They try all the exits, and they they find that they have been locked in their own home with the psychopath. And that alone is just amazing, because it took all of the stuff that was so (laughs) normal and safe, and now... None of it is. Yeah. Yeah. Had to throw I, that one out there. I love it. <laughs> I can't remember the, the name of the movie off the top of my head. It's a Japanese horror film about a mom trying to rebuild her life after a divorce. Mm-hmm. And she's going to work and stuff. And there's this giant uh, stain on her ceiling from water. And slowly it grows and it grows and it grows. And some disturbing things start happening. But it's the stain in her home that really just kind of gets you this un- uneasy feeling that something is wrong because it's growing and no one cares. Yeah. Specific examples are hard, uh, especially for it's done <laughs> wrong. I'm less of a horror person, so I can't think of anything <laughs> in particular uh, that hasn't already been mentioned. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like- yeah, I'm trying I, to think of ones done poorly too, because I I feel like I just don't I tend to avoid poor horror. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I usually I, don't hold them in my brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, this just Home looks really gory. I'm, I'm not sure that's what I want. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think Phoenix. probably. Sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh no. Um, I don't know. You could. Um, I think Frankenstein could actually be kind of an interesting one because. Huh. Um. In a sense, because you you have someone. Um, I mean, part part of what's going on with with um, Doctor Frankenstein. Uh, he he actually has kind of a normal. Uh, he comes from a normal space, um, and he kind of ruins his own uh, normal mm-hmm. space. Um, so it, it talks. He talks in there a lot about like I had a good family growing up. You know, they treated me well. So it's not like he was in a dysfunctional home or something. And he, he feels like kind of like he's let his family down as he's um, kind of gone off and and dabbled in in things in uh, kind of a pseudoscience sense um, and uh, created this monster that then consumes his life and and comes in and. Um, at one point dr frankenstein gets married and on his wedding night like he's waiting for the monster to come because the monster has said that he's going to come and attack his wife and or attack him he thinks he's going to come attack him and the monster comes and kills his wife (laughs) and so this monster that he's created intrudes itself into his domesticity and he can't find any peace and he can't settle down until he's finally hunted down the monster um, and it, it consumes his whole life after that. So he's he he started off with something that was very functional and very normal and very loving with his family. And then as he's created this monster, the monster literally took all of that that he created himself. So he he removed himself from that um, uh, that piece that he inherited from his family. So that's kind of a, an interesting example, I think. Mm-hmm. In the same vein, the, the other character, the monster. Who names himself Adam 
has a very different point mm-hmm. of view. He wants a normal life. He can't have it because he mm-hmm. is a monster. And so mm-hmm. a lot of the story is him trying to have a normal life and being uh, unable to have that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, I kind of interpreted it as like some of it is his anger that he can't have a normal life. And yeah. so he's lashing out. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, he he was abandoned by his creator, is what it is. Um, so uh, perhaps perhaps if Doctor Frankenstein hadn't been so freaked out that he actually succeeded, <laughs> he wasn't something. expecting that result. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like ah, <laughs> if he hadn't abandoned the monster, it might have been okay. All the relationships might have worked out, but uh, um, so going yeah. back to the <laughs> question, just... I, I'm still trying to think of examples of it done. Poorly, and while I don't have any specific ones, I do have a trend. I know for me, when that rings hollow, is when the level of the level and the type of emotional reaction from the characters doesn't match with what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. So either mm-hmm. because they're taking something away that's supposed to be a big deal, but I didn't see it as normal or important to begin with, yeah. or it's a small thing that I didn't understand the importance, and the character is way freaked out about it, like oh no, they took my baseball cards and they're just having a complete meltdown. If I don't understand the significance of the baseball cards, that's not going to make any sense to me. Oh yeah. no, Edward's yeah. gone. <laughs> so adding on to that, because that's a great point. I think that's one of the reasons um, like Stephen King, why his books work so well, so to everyone about his endings, but he takes the time to talk about the characters. We understand their inner working so well that when something that, might seem minor to anyone else happens we know it's important mm-hmm. to this character and that's mm-hmm. why i say that that's why for your stories you need to start with that home life you have to establish what matters to your characters or mm-hmm. it's not going to work yeah. I think, yeah. yeah another one horn's done really well it's hard to find i think it's on shutter it's an old horror movie called the changeling it's in the from the 1980s you don't want the modern <laughs> drama there's <laughs> one part where just a rubber ball bounces down the stairs of the house. And because of how they've integrated that into the character's backstory and what's normal and where things are, that is one of the most horrifying moments in the entire movie. Mm. So that's an example of it done really, really well. It's just a rubber ball, but it means so much more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's segue our way back into um, the writing aspect of I think something that we've we've talked about like what domesticity is, um, the normalcy, how it can be twisted for horror purposes. Um, I think though that part of the reason people are here at this panel is to find out how do you make something super fantastical seem normal to your reader right at the start. So how about we like if it's a fantasy or a sci-fi setting that's completely yeah like when you're Pandora. Or I, I actually uh, have no. Oh, I have to deal with that with a book I'm working on right now about a guy who lives on Mars, and what I do is I have him not respond to something weird. Like he's traveling in his house all the way through space, being tugged by this giant ship, and he's playing a video game on his phone because he's like, ah, another day. So the response from people around you we would all be really help you out. like <laughs> yeah yeah true yeah if you give huh. the readers someone they can relate to regardless of the setting they will kind of start to mirror that character's reactions yeah. so um yeah. just i'm gonna throw out one of mine my second novel uh, son of thunder it has electric dragons right but it's kind of a 1920s-esque setting so what do they do they plug those dragons into the city's power grid and that cool. they just use them for power. And oh, fun! I like to think that's a cool thing, but the, for the characters, it's like, oh, yeah, the city just bought a new dragon last that's month. That's just how it is. It's <laughs> just how it is. So if the characters, yeah. just, like my opening scene is a scene with one of these dragons, and it yeah. just kind of establishes that for these characters in this world, this is mundane. I'd hope for the reader it's something exciting and fantastical, but in the world it's not. Yeah. When I'm working with writers, the main thing that this usually comes down to is it's a matter of focus. So reaction is definitely a big part of it, but focus is the other part in terms of the narrative. The more time and the more words you spend on something, the more either strange or important it's going to feel. 
because there's got to be a reason. There's usually a reason the character is focused on it. It either means a lot to them, it's weird, or it's needed for something else going on. But kind of what James was saying is if they walk past the power plant and hear the dragon roaring, and there's no focus spent on it other than the dragon roared and there was a surge of electricity, I mean, that that makes it seem... That must be pretty normal in the setting. And I would say, um, just in terms of creating, you know, a concept uh, of something like a, an alien species that has slightly different anatomy, um, you want to mix kind of the familiar with something unfamiliar. And um, yeah, just, just kind of going with um, what Clark was talking about um, with, you know, the more you emphasize something, the, the more detail you put on it, you know, the more the reader's going to feel like that's important to the plot. Um, so there's there's some things you can do, you know, if you're just trying to, uh, and you don't always have to describe what a character looks like even necessarily, which can be a little bit frustrating if you have a like an alien or something like that. You might want to jump into describing exactly what they look like or something. But, you know, as you go along, just make it more like, you know, when they're interacting with something, they extend a tentacle and it tastes things in the air or something like that, yeah. you know, just mm -hmm. kind of integrate it into normal things they're doing to kind of get a sense of what they look like. Um, I think the story Dawn by Octavia Butler actually does a good job of that. It's kind of uh, an interesting, slow introduction that has a little bit of tension to it, but there's this alien creature that you kind of slowly get an idea of what it looks like as it's kind of interacting and, and doing weird things um, in uh, the main character's environment. Um, so yeah, so just kind of build what that character looks like or what other things in the world look like slowly, you know, as that character interacts with it, as opposed to trying to, you know, give this description of all the things that are different all at once. Yeah. Two other examples that are really, really good for that are Fire Upon the Deep uh, by, I don't remember who, um, which is going to bug me now. But he has a race of these miniature hive mind creatures that are, they're basically a bunch of dogs that because they're in harmony, they use their mouths like different sets of fingers. Mm. But he introduces that as a slow burn. So it took me a while to understand what was going on there. China Mieville is also really good at this. So if you want to watch or listen to or read Perdido Street Station, that's another one where there's tons and tons of bizarre creatures and bizarre customs that he does a great job of introducing and to varying extents from different POVs, making it feel normal. They're really good. <laughs> Another method is to have a different emotion to the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. In Hawaiian culture, you want to smell each other's breath. And that's uh, an important part of their life. Uh, do you know what the word ha means? The breath of life means breath of life. Ah, oh, you've been to the PCC. I oh, I, I uh, actually lived there for a while, so. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, aloha actually means I love your breath, hmm. and hmm. Uh, mahalo, which means thanks or something like that, actually means praise be to your breath. Interesting. And so when they walk up to each, when they walk up to each other, they'll put their noses together, and they'll breathe out, so that they can smell each other's breath. Interesting. And because it's a really important part of their Yeah, it's the, oh. the, the breath is seen as an extension of your soul. And so mm -hmm. that's like basically intimacy is sharing breath. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. That's really cool. COVID yeah. must yeah. be yeah. real rough on yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, I, Polynesian cultures tend to be very extroverted. And, and yeah, I bet that's hard. Man. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. Just but actually, like, hmm? well, what, what actually that kind of makes me think of <laughs> what that makes me think of is just uh, um, on that note, um, what represents intimacy in different cultures. Like uh, you know, we we think of a in our culture, um, we think of a kiss on the lips as being a romantic thing, but in many cultures, that's just a friendly thing. You do that with anybody, mm -hmm. and so and and so it can sometimes be very easy. Like if you're looking at historical stories or historical paintings or that kind of thing. And, and you come across a depiction of, you know, two friends kissing each other. I notice sometimes that people will be like, wait, what's going on there? When in their culture, it just represents being good friends. 
And so sometimes like you can play with that. Like if say, say that you have in your fantastical setting, you have a character who's from a setting that maybe is more familiar to us and then a character who's from somewhere else and they interact and they have to learn like, how do you engage in that kind of basic social stuff? You know, is a hug just, hey, I, I'm, I'm friends with you? Is a hug a way that you greet a stranger? Or is a hug something you only do for somebody that you're in love with? You know, like, mm-hmm. and you can have clashes of cultures between your characters in those stories that can introduce interesting conflicts. Mm-hmm. I've had an experience like that. Uh, it was a uh, Middle Eastern culture. Mm-hmm. And I was being introduced to the family. I was helping them out with something. And I walked in, and I didn't know that they kiss you passionately on the lips as a, <laughs> a greeting. But you, mm-hmm. it was only for the men. So I met mm-hmm. the father, the uncle, the grandfather, another brother, another brother. And then I met their beautiful daughter. And I had to shake her hands because that is how you properly do it. <laughs> and to this day, it has haunted me. Because I'm like, come on. It was an opportunity. <laughs> But that is uh, one of those cultural things where you have to know how people greet each other. Uh, Scandinavian culture is like 10, six feet away or the length (laughs) of a sword or a spear. You may just wave. Uh, Yeah. In uh, I I was actually really happy for the six feet thing for COVID because I grew up kind of of German and you don't get close (laughs) unless you're close. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yeah, stay away from me. Yeah, there we go. (laughs) Good. 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 Do we have any more questions or uh yeah. were there any more questions that came up well we're about out of time i think yeah, yeah. Here's, yeah. here's one that you can probably do it's pretty quick um i'd love to hear about more specifics of domesticity that you see writers sometimes forgetting about like the clothes thing oh. at the beginning that is a good one uh, well i mean to me domesticity and and home is like yeah what do you wear? What do you eat? How do you speak? You know, your, 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 your dialect. Dialect is another thing like culture, you know, of your, your own, the way your family speaks versus the way your town speaks versus the way, you know, a larger community speaks. And so that could kind of demonstrate domesticity is, is the use of language. Um, Dialect's a hard one. Because if you don't do it perfectly, it really throws the reader out. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. And so, and so be careful with that. The one I think, um, sorry, go ahead. No, continue. Um, the yeah. one I think I see missed the most is tools. Oh, yeah. Because where they come from and the specific jobs that they're meant to serve, it can be very, very interesting and very unique. And it's something that gets overlooked. So thinking about not just where did they get the standard stuff, where did they get the knife, where did they get the hammer that they're using, but if they have to deal with a certain type of plant, do they have a special tool for that? How do they make the tool? Mm-hmm. Who designed the tool? Thinking about stuff like that can really shape a lot about normalcy of your culture. And I don't see that a ton. Mm-hmm. And there's kind and of if a- if you have a specialized- <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, there's kind of a planting the gun on the mantle concept, too, where if, if you oh, want someone to that. have a weapon or something later on, it's good to see it before they suddenly yeah. need it. And it's like, oh, here, I magically now have the gun that I need to, to use. Yeah. Sadly, well, we are out of time. We've got okay. two minutes, so we need to sign off. So could each of you take 15 seconds to let us know where to find you at the rest of the convention or outside of the convention with Clark first. Yeah, so you can find me at crrowanson.com. That's the best way to get hold of me. I'm going to drop a link to my website and to my workbook in the uh, in the room in the chat. Uh, that's the easiest place to get a hold of me. Uh, uh, same for me. You can find me at jamesjakins.com. It's just the blog I never updates, but it's got links to all my stuff, uh, including my newsletter, which I have a free novella for anyone that signs up for that. Uh, yeah. Read my books. Okay. I just want to point out we have a uh, beard contest going on right here now. Who's got a <laughs> just 
Uh, anyway, um, you can find me on Native Video Gamer on YouTube. Video Gamer is one word. And I study how culture and uh, video games and all that stuff interact. And I will be having a book coming out sometime this year called A Clockwork Elf about a uh, elf and an engineer hunting monsters in Victorian England. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'm going to be like four or five different uh, panels after this. So see you when I see you. Cool. Yeah. All right. So um, you can um, you can find my blog at slithersofthought.com, or if that's hard to hear over the speaker, you can just do my name, sarahesealy.com, and that'll get you to my blog. I'm also trying to start a YouTube channel, and I'm trying to give away some Kindle copies of some of my stories. Um, so if you want to hop over there and find my, my most recent video and leave a comment on there, or you can find my Facebook page and leave a comment. Um, I'd love to give away some free Kindle reads to some of my stories. Emma. I guess I'm feeling a bit left out because I don't have a website or a YouTube or any of those things. <laughs> I'm working on all this stuff. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm at the, the starting level to all, to all these stuff. Um, you can contact me through, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, we're, we're on Discord here. So I, I check that pretty often. So you can contact me through there. Um, Probably that's the most effective right now. I can hand out my email address to anybody who's interested. So, all right, I'm Dre Griffin, DreGriffin.com. Sometimes I stream on Twitch, art stuff, and sometimes it's chores. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you can find it, find me anywhere by going to DreGriffin.com. <laughs>